Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Ministry Misfits. Andrew, glad to be back in the studio. Just yes. you and I today. Yes. No no, no guests. No, yeah, no sicknesses. Guess. No guests. No, no problems. Yeah. Sure. No problems. <laughs> Something I wish like it was that. no problems yeah. that we wouldn't have to talk about what we're talking about today. Some new exciting things happening, one of which is a fantasy football league. Yes, so we the, are in season two and the fantasy football league is also coming back. Yes. In season two. Kind of coming back. Kind of new. Just like season two. Was Revamped. For, yes. So this year for fantasy football, we are having a league again. This year, though, we've upgraded a little bit due to the... Well, I'm going to call it what it was. The whining coming from the losing teams last year <laughs> about the way that we did it, where there was no draft and it was auto pick. And nobody nobody else. liked that. Nobody I, I enjoyed it. I, know you I think it, it was, was great. But regardless of whether or not you're right or not, we are doing a live draft this year, September 4th at around four o'clock ish we can move the time you know depending on after everybody joins we decide there's a better option if you can't make the draft and still want to join that's okay because you can set your your draft block ahead of time and it will pick for you there is a ten dollar cover charge but that cover charge is going to our partners over at tikva to help raise some money for them as the school year gets started yep we also have a nice prize pack this year. Yeah, for the grand prize winner. Yes, grand prize winner gets a Misfits merch pack that's got some of the new stuff in it because we do have some new items in the merch store if you want to go check that out, um, as well as a, a nice plaque yeah. that was requested by last year's winner that he said he wanted something for his wall. So shout out to, to Coach Dwight. He The plaque is... The plaque is happening this year. Yes, you got, you got to go back to back now. Yeah, you got to go back to back to get it because I'm not paying for two of them. <laughs> so if you want to join, just all you got to do actually is comment on this video. Hey, I want in. And then we will contact you with the information as far as how to get your payment in. And then we'll get you the link to join as well. Yep. Or by going on to our website. Yes, if you go to the, the website. Yes, if you look, when you go to the w website on the homepage, right at the top, there's a football. Click on it, and then it will take you to the information that you need to sign up for it there as well. Um, there's also, if you don't see the football, because I'm not sure if it actually worked on the mobile one or not, if you go to support on the website, then you will find the fantasy football link there. There we go. I think that's all of our announcements. We talked about yes. the new stuff in the store. Check that out. Again, the Teak Fatigue is still available. Yes, and the Teak Fatigue is also in the price pack as well. So, yeah. And that leads us into, as we finish with the business, Andrew, what are we talking about today? Finish with the business. Wow. So I think that's the first time I've actually gotten to use the rim shot. I don't know. Um, so we are talking today about business. Because this is a this is something that uh, is a little complicated, yes. and it's very confusing, and this actually causes a lot of problems in a lot of churches, and has for a very long time. Mm -hmm. Because there is a big misunderstanding as far as mindset is concerned between a business mind and somebody that is straight ministry minded. Yeah, and. It's something where it's very easy to, one, see this cause major division. Yeah. I mean, it causes major divisions in marriages. So, yes, I'm not surprised that it carries over into the church, unfortunately. Yes. It also, though, can be very easily rectified yes. if there is an understanding as to why the two sides can't seem to figure out where each other is at. And so that's what we want to talk about today because you, sir, are a businessman mm -hmm. and are business minded. Although you do understand the ministry mindset as well. So yes. we actually can have, have a, this conversation. Yeah. The biggest difference I will disclose is 
make a disclaimer on is I have not worked. Well, I actually technically have worked in a church before, but as an intern, but any, right. That doesn't count. But as you much understand as yeah. because you've been having these conversations for a year now, because I think we're pretty close to your one year anniversary as well for being on here. So yeah. Yeah. Over that. So it's pretty close though. Cause it was around August, September that you finally were able yeah. to record. I'll wait for my cake. Yeah. So, with, um, with the plaque. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, Yes, you you understand that side. Mm -hmm. Anybody that has listened to any of these knows I am pretty much 100% ministry minded. Yeah. And so we are going to actually discuss the difference. And part of the reason that we are definitely needing to do this right now is that the, in the news cycles, there has been an increase of this as well. You've got all of the sex abuse reports coming out from all over the place. You've got the financial scandals coming out from all over the place. You have all the political scandals and entanglements involving the church coming out all over the place. And there's also a renewed discussion about the need for NDAs or non-disclosure agreements and attorney, pri attorney client privileges as mm -hmm. well. When we're recording this, just yesterday, the FBI announced that they were now investigating the Southern Baptist Convention for the Sex Abuse ta Task Force report. And immediately, there were some people that immediately got on there saying, see, this is why you never should have waived attorney-client privilege, because now we're going to lose a bunch of money. Hmm. We're going to talk about all three of well, we're going to discuss this in three three things. You're going to ex come at it from the business side, mostly. Yep. You're also going to be able to come at it from the Christian business side. And then I am going to come at it from the ministry and church side of this. And we're going to compare and contrast the difference and hopefully be able to get to why this discussion actually needs to happen within your church as well. So the three areas we're going to cover with this are NDAs non-disclosure agreements, budgets, both what, how to make the budget and how to fund that budget. And then three is success. How do we actually define success? Mm -hmm. So to start with, we're going to start out with talking about non-disclosure agreements. Now, Brandon, explain to everybody what a non-disclosure agreement actually is. Yeah, so typically it's some sort of legal document that they won't share certain information or confidential information or information at all, depending upon what it is, uh, typically for a certain time period as well. And so there might be some restrictions in there, but typically it's, hey, we can't, you can't talk about this or information cannot be shared um, that is very confidential. And it's like I said, typically for a period of time. And now normally this is something that you have to sign at the beginning. Of yes. Employment. Correct. I've had it once where it was like in the middle of my employment, but that was more of a voluntary NDA. And now see, that is one key word with all of this is voluntary. Within the, what you describe there is what we see normally within the church world as well. It's a, you are not going to talk about this. You're not going to take any of this to the press. You're not going to talk about this with your families. You're not going to talk about this with anybody. The problem with NDAs in a ministry setting is that there is nothing that should be needed to talk about that an NDA covers that is not already covered by law. Clergy are mandatory reporters. Mm -hmm. So if you don't know what a mandatory reporter is, this would be teachers, law enforcement, medical staff, clergy are, th are the big ones. And a mandatory reporter is required to report any type of child abuse, neglect, Sexual abuse, terrorism is the other big one. Okay. You've got to report those things. That is not covered under any kind of HIPAA laws or privacy laws or even counseling laws. 
Yeah, typically due to the protection. Right, because it is to the harm of themselves or others. Suicide is the other one that is required to be. I don't know why that didn't come to my mind. Suicide also has to be reported. The rest of anything that is confessed in a Catholic setting, confession, so you go to the priest and confess your sins to the priest, that is a confidential conversation. It does not leave the priest's ears. Mm Mm-hmm. Any type of counseling session, you come to a a pastor for counseling, whether it's in a professional setting or even it's just a casual setting, you are covered by privacy laws. The pastor is not, is legally not obligated to share anything out of that that does not involve suicide, self-harm, harm to children, or harm to the nation in terms of terrorism or you know anything like that or fear yes everything else is covered by clergy law so brandon what would just from that idea what possibly could be left that would need to be covered by an nda in a church setting i would say if there's maybe any practices that are happening within the organization um, as far as like the structures, how it's concerned, maybe where money is being sent to, um, how certain organizations... So you're talking security purposes like for foreign... No, I would say just... Well, I guess, yeah, you're right. Uh, So if there was doing ministry, if there was missionaries overseas and either the person themselves, the missionaries, or the money where it was going needed to be non-disclosed. That could be a reason to keep that. This can get deeper into the business conversation. So with a church being run like a business um, and people tithing and bringing their money in, a lot of times it's it should feel like it's an open book or an open door to where is the money going. And not all the times that is disclosed to say exactly where said dollars are going here or to this person or this ministry. Sometimes that is kept very close to the vest, um, which it doesn't always need to be public information per se. But in my opinion, I think it would be nice to at least for members of that church to be included. And now this is where we start getting into the budget side of it as well, which we'll leave for a second. With the NDAs, part of the issue with NDAs within ministry is I, for one, say pretty much without exception that non-disclosure agreements have no place within a Christian ministry. Because we already said everything that needs to be, that is not already part of mandatory reporting is covered by law. You don't, you don't need a non-disclosure agreement to not share somebody's struggles. Yeah. The non-disclosure agreements then only would cover things that are in the mandatory reporter list. And that is a problem. Mm-hmm. And this is where we can get into Christian ethics. Because part of what you were talking about, and this is a valid concern, is security for brothers and sisters that are in in secret, in secrecy. Yeah. But Christian ethics already should allow us to not be willing to share that information. Regardless of consequences to us. This goes back to the rights and the rights episode we did. Yeah. So you're saying it's better to just have the conversation of... Hey, we have minis- minis- missionaries overseas. They're, Easy for you to say. Uh, yeah. Um, their location is private or secretive that if somebody knowing there could bring harm to them or their family, please keep it a secret. Like, right. You, there's you're, no, you're basically not signing that there's legal no, Yes, there's binding. no legal. There should not be any kind of legal binding document needed within a church in these sort of settings. This is part of where in Matthew, Matthew 10, Matthew 18, all of those different places where we talk about these kind of agreements and disagreements among believers of why we talk about the fact that you don't you don't need to bring a lawyer into any of this until it reaches a point of excommunication. Mm -hmm. 
at that point, you're going to, you treat them as if they're an unbeliever, which means you pray for them. You treat them as you would any other non-believer. But that also means that at that point you may need, you know, to get a lawyer involved or a third party or whatever, yeah. you know, depending on your context. You don't need a legal document threatening somebody with legal action for sharing information about what's going on with your church, unless you are worried about what that information might do. And if you're worried about what that information might do to your church, the question should be, should that stuff actually be happening within your church to begin with? Because most of the time where we see NDAs being placed are in situations of spiritual abuse of power. Mm -hmm. NDAs are red flags for me with churches and ministries. The, I have been, I, there were attempts to force me to sign two different times, not within churches, but within Christian ministries. And I refused to sign both times because there is no reason for a Christian organization to need to have a non-disclosure agreement signed. Uh, when I say organization, I'm not talking Christian businesses. I'm talking, yeah, that, that's what I was going to clarify. I'm talking quick. ministries. If you meant, yeah. If you yes. meant like churches or, so I, I guess the other part of that would be, cause this is in, in between, let's say a nonprofit right. that is Christian so, based or focused. Right. Like, so what is that nonprofit doing? Is it a nonprofit that is more of a business or is it a nonprofit that is more of a para ministry? It could depend. You know, a yeah. para ministry, there really would be no reason for an NDA because if you are out there doing ministry, everything either is covered by clergy law, privacy laws, or it's covered by, again, Christian ethics. Yep. Ministry ethics of. Even if the police come to me demanding an answer about somebody that is not part of a non-disclosure agreement, my duty is to the person that disclosed information to me. And so Christian ethics, again, going back to our rights and government episode, is we submit to the authority, meaning that we accept the consequences of our actions. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that we go out and find an attorney right away to prevent having to share information about sex abuse, about terrorism, about a potential suicide attempt, about neglect, harm, any of those sort of things. Because those Christian ethics would tell us those we need to report. Yeah. Because we are supposed to care about the least of these. Mm -hmm. And we're supposed to also keep our brothers and sisters accountable. The other part, too, is just when stuff is talked about is like, where's your heart at? It's right. That's where typically then the sin can fall in with the gossip, the slander of what is being shared from your mouth of knowledge from the church or right. organization. If you are sharing stuff from the church just to get the church in trouble or just to get the pastor you don't like off the pulpit. That's a completely different thing than what we're talking about. That is a violation of Christian ethics, and it's a and it's sinful. Yeah, you're slandering, you're accusing the brethren. It's false accusations, all those sort of things. And now this again, the heart side of this is different than what some of our friends on Twitter get accused of all the time. Because there's a difference between sharing their experiences with the purpose of wanting to warn others or call the people they are talking about to repentance. And just starting to spread a bunch of false rumors around. Mm -hmm. Those are two completely different things. And again, it's a heart issue. And you can, and if you actually are concerned, just talking with the people for five minutes will pretty much be able to let you know where the heart actually is. Yeah. Now, the other side of NDAs that you already started talking about is the budget mm -hmm. as far as where spending and all that goes. And that's something we're going to address in deeper detail after we take a quick break. We'll be right back. Season two of the Ministry Misfits podcast and our awesome theme song are brought to you by Laird Creative Agency. 
In our social media world, the next connection is always one click or scroll away and your business has to be ready when they find you. That's why Laird Creative is always looking for ways to step your brand up. Whether you're looking to overhaul your brand one time with a new website or want to save money by outsourcing your graphic and media content, Laird Creative Agency is here to help. Laird Creative's mission is to take the difficulty out of the creative process. With Laird Creative, you'll find a dedicated team of artists ready to tackle any creative need that your business has, big or small. If you're looking for an easier way to share the vision of your organization through thoughtful branding and creative content, find them at LairdCreativeAgency.com to get started. Mention the Ministry Misfits podcast and get a free consultation call. Laird Creative, step your brand up. We're back. All right, welcome back. We are still here talking business Mm -hmm. and not talking business at the same time. (laughs) Yes, exactly. (laughs) So we are having the discussion that needs to happen in most churches that doesn't happen most of the time. And that is this conversation between a business and a ministry mindset. Mm -hmm. And we started the conversation with non-disclosure agreements because unfortunately they need to that discussion is needing to happen more often now. And part of what we talked about was within business, there are areas that NDAs definitely need to happen. Yeah. We understand that. Yeah, but if there's certain secrets uh, or certain processes that are happening. That... Right. Nobody is allowed to share the recipe for the secret sauce. Yeah. Right. Within churches, though, there is never a reason for a non-disclosure agreement to need to be handed out. Because everything is already covered by clergy laws or Christian ethics. Anything else is going to be a violation of one of those two things. And so churches, if you're if you're thinking, oh, do we need to get a non-disclosure agreement written up to have on file? Just say no. The other side of this is where we get into the money side of things. And this is where I already know I'm going to possibly make Brandon's head spin on air. Yeah, we'll see how this goes. The first part of this, though, we already talked about within the non disclosure There is a section of this that will go back to the non-disclosure agreement. So just hold with us. We're going to start, though, with within a budget. Brandon, what in a business setting is the way that we, first of all, need to build up finances? From a business standpoint? From a business standpoint, what is the mindset as far as this is how we this is how we build up finance finances. Uh, There's a handful of different ways, depending upon business setup established. Um, Some could be more like campaigned or you get investors or backers to bring money to the table prior to kind of getting started. Um, Others are, you start off with a loan potentially and get going from there. And then you continually make money. And then there's your gross, the net, you sell pro- product. Because if you don't, then you you're probably then, not a real, you're not going to be a business. Yeah, you're going to stay in the red for a while. And then depending, again, depending upon what you have, there might be overhead and different stuff to um, keep going on there. But typically the main thing is you make a product, you make a profit that continues to accumulate over time. And then there's also the group overseeing that depending upon what, what it looks like of board of directors. Um, but if you get into more of the corporate world where it is a publicly traded company, then their main job is to make sure the company is profitable. And so you see your little stock market going up. That's really their main goal. The key, the key word there is profit. Yes. And that's with an F because we've already talked to nonprofits and nonprofits using both words. But today <laughs> we are just talking with the F. Now. Money is the key. Mm-hmm. And that really is the key for everything within the business side of things. Churches, that's not the case. Money is not, the the profit is not the key within a church. Mm-hmm. Church budgets are supposed to be built off of, what would you say? The need of... Well, I, what is it? It's not profit, it's... Tithes and offerings, right? Uh, yes. Oh, where it's coming from. Yeah, gotcha. where it's gotcha. coming from. Yeah. It's tithes and offerings is normally what it is. Gifts to the church. Yep. 
sometimes there are investors, especially churches that are trying to build a building. You know, they will still they'll sell building bonds and things like that as a way to m build up the building itself. Yep. So there is sometimes some of the investor side, but you normally don't see churches m making their budget fully on sales of product. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't mean to, to say that there aren't some ministers that can't do that. Because we, you know, one of the things that we talk about in sports ministry all the time is that sports ministry will pay for itself. Parents already are paying huge amounts of money for kids to go play in these leagues where they're not even getting playing time and the coaches hate them and everything else. So churches that offer sports leagues at a at half the cost of what the city is and offering them with actual mentors and instruction and quality time and offering, you know, weekends are free for the parents to actually be able to spend time with their kids. Mm -hmm. You can make the full amount needed to cover your ministry off of people coming in to compete and things like that. But that's different than profits and stock margins. Yeah. Because the end goal is not about the budget. The end goal is about the lives that are coming into the gym. Mm -hmm. When we, the first thing I want to make sure that we are also clear on, because again, I had this conversation with another pastor, not a, just somebody asking the question, with another pastor the past week, as far as what is the difference between a tithe and an offering? Because this gets into why we even need to have these things within our churches. Because some look at churches are always asking for support as they're looking for the profit mindset. Mm -hmm. But that's not the case. And we'll give the biblical argument that for a minute. But Brandon, first, we'll see if you can tell me the difference. What is the difference between a tithe and an offering? I'm going to say the tithe would be the financial giving of an individual or a family to the church um kind of no questions asked well i shouldn't say that because there you can kind of we'll say get to questions to... asked in a minute <laughs> basically giving portion of your money to what portion 10 percent. i mean at least what's traditionally taught um giving that back to the church to to use as as needed to continue the ministry of the church um, offering, then I would say could be something in addition to that, either like financially, it could be offering of time. It could be offering a resource. It could be a simple, like larger donation of, Hey, you need a large couch for the children's ministry place. Like here is, here's the couch. Here's the couch. <laughs> yeah. So you're half right. On both of them. A tithe is only 10%. That literally is what tithe means, is it's a tenth. In the Bible, we see tithes are both financial, it's first fruits, it's livestock. Mm -hmm. It's 10% of your wages. That is a tithe. That is the only thing that can be a tithe. Now, an offering or a sacrifice can be anything thing it can also be financial if it's more than 10 percent or less than 10 percent that would be an offering now within a new testament church though what is actually the call is it tithe or offering and this is where we can possibly get people met <laughs> i would say offering why because just that 10% seems very legalistic. Um, and from the heart side, if like, if you're able to give abundantly. Well, it's not necessarily legalistic because 10%, and this is, again, we're got to look at out of a Western context and just a universal context here. 10% to wealthy people is nothing. 10% to somebody living paycheck by paycheck or somebody in, you know, the, in Jesus's time, 10% could be a major portion of their budget. See, I would, 
disagree and say it's the opposite. If I am making $10 a week, 10% is only a dollar. But if I'm making a million dollars a week, then a hundred thousand dollars. So it makes a big difference. It's harder to give up that a hundred thousand. I'm not talking about hard to give up. I'm talking about harder as far as a sacrifice. Gotcha. And this is, is where this is where Jesus's words about the rich man comes in. It's yep. harder for rich. It's almost impossible for rich people to enter heaven. The key word there is almost, yeah, because nothing is impossible with God. Mm-hmm. That's the other part of that that story that people forget is that nothing is impossible with God. So God can say it's impossible for a rich man to enter heaven, but that doesn't mean that rich people can't get into heaven because nothing is impossible with God. Yeah, but. It is easier to give up money when you don't have much. But it's much harder to survive on 90% when you don't have as much. Correct. So it's not necessarily that it's not necessarily a legalism thing. But the reason why we are called for offerings in the New Testament is that God calls for 100% of our finances, of our lives, of our children of our spouse, of our parent, he, we are supposed to give everything over to him. That doesn't make sense in a business model. Mm-mm. You that's, would love for your customer, people want you to give their life. Right. <laughs> you would love for that to happen, but that doesn't work in a business model. But our budgets as ministries are supposed to be coming from people that are giving 100% of themselves. Now, we still most of the time just talk in we're going to take tithes and offerings because some people can only give 10% finances. Yep. And that's okay. Yeah. It's okay if some people can only give 1%. That's okay. It's okay if some people can't actually give financially, but they are able to give in other ways. That is okay. Tithing is not a sinful thing or not tithing is not a sinful thing. Not being Willing to sacrifice is another discussion. Yeah. And being a steward, basically being a good steward right. of what God's given you. Now, that's how we get the budgets. But actually budgeting out, so spending, what are the key pieces to a business budget? Just give us a summary. Yes. Uh, most businesses will look at current year or past year and say, where were we? What what did we spend money on? Um, and then forecasting of where are we going? And then creating that set game plan of, okay, this is where money is going to be spent and or distributed throughout the next year or throughout the next budget. And then also determining where money is coming in from. So some places like a nonprofit might get grant money or different things. Right. And depending upon depending on that to continue the growth of their um, mission or vision. Uh, businesses obviously need to continue to hit a certain benchmark of sales to continue to have that said budget um, available. And normally the main pieces of spending, the biggest portion of spending normally goes to what? Insurance. No, that wasn't where I was going, but yes. No, I'm talking normally a good portion is, well, we'll say a good business should a good portion should be going towards paying their employees. Yes. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Insurance. And, and part, I understand. Part of that, yeah. Unfortunately, businesses pay a good portion of their right. business. We're goes saying in that, a but... good, I, a good idea of a business, a good portion of the budget should be spent towards actually providing for their employees within churches. This is where one of the discussions in business meetings starts to get a little bit heated. And not always, but just unfortunately, I've been in a few where this is the case. Is that a ministry budget, typically a overall church budget is divided up between the different ministries of the church. Insurance. Mm -hmm. The building and then staff pay. And then each individual ministry gets to decide how they're budgeting out their own money and all of that. But a portion goes to each ministry and everything like that. The conversation that gets a little heated at times is 
should the pastor be getting paid as much as he is? Mm. Because, of course, all he does is come in on Sundays. Yeah. Well, as we learned from Beth Alice Barr the other week, she's I liked her statement because she said that should be the smallest like preparation yes. portion of the week. I mean, you're and most in most churches that is. Yeah, because most churches are smaller. Shout out again if you want to do the sports ministry side and you are one of these smaller churches and like I can never get that. Hit us up. We'll get you in touch with CSRM to do small church initiative because there are ways of doing this. That's a side note. The but what we when we talk about these smaller churches, normally they only have one or two staff members. They've got the pastor and then maybe either there's a secretary or you've got an, an associate pastor on staff. Yeah. And the conversation always is coming in as far as how do we pay the pastor? Because either you're in a big, big church and the pastor actually makes a good bit. Or you're in a small church and the pastor hopefully is at least getting paid. This isn't an issue that you run into with businesses. Businesses know they have to pay their employees. There are laws involved. Yeah. <laughs> And typically you're like, hey, the CEO should be making the most amount of money. And, and that's another discussion as well. Some churches, the pastor is technically the CEO, but in some churches, he is not. Some churches actually have executive pastors. Some have executive elders that take on those kind of roles. That is something where if you don't know how that works, you just need to look in your church's constitution or just ask. Because they they have to tell you what what the structure is there, unless they sign an NDA. Unless they sign an NDA, <laughs> which is just in a whole nother red and then, flag. And then send them this episode. Yes, that's a whole nother red flag. But there is actually a biblical reason to taking care of your pastor financially, and we can't find the big Bible that makes it easier to read for some reason. I think SE probably moved it. So. <laughs> First uh, Corinthians chapter nine. This is the 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 chapter where we get the idea of all things to all people, right? That's the evangelistic side of things. That is not what we're focusing on. We are focusing in here on verses eight through fourteen, and this is what it says. Am I saying this from a human perspective? Doesn't the law also the say also say the same thing? For it is written in the law of Moses, do not muzzle an ox while it treads out grain. Is God really concerned about the oxen? Isn't he really saying it for our sake? Yes, this is written for our sake, because he who plows ought to plow in hope, and he who threshes should thresh in hope of sharing the crop. We have sown spiritual things for you. Is it too much if we reap material benefits from you? If others have this right to receive benefits from you, don't we even more? Nevertheless, we have not made use of this right. Instead, we endure everything so that we might not hinder the gospel of Christ. Don't you know that those who perform the temple services eat the food from the temple, and those who serve at the altar share in the offerings of the altar? In the same way, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should earn their living by the gospel. So, Paul, we know, is a tent maker by trade and does not take salary. We also know from what we read in Philippians 4 that he does occasionally get gifts from people to carry on. Mm -hmm. But what Paul is saying here in 1 Corinthians 9 is that just because he chooses to live this way does not mean that everyone needs to. And that sometimes this idea of you should not get paid for the gospel, or some the phrase that gets used sometimes is you are selling the gospel. Mm -hmm. You are trying to make money off of Jesus. You know, these t-shirts are trying to make money off of the, off of a ministry method. All of those sort of things are people that are stuck in a business mindset and missing the ministry mindset that we see in 1 Corinthians 9. You don't muzzle the ox while he's treading grain. Yeah. Because when he's tied down, he cannot work effectively. Mm -hmm. You need to be taking care of your pastor and their families financially. Not because they are selling out the gospel or because they're too lazy to go out and get another job or because they think they're better than you and so they don't need another job. 
but because that is what we are called to do as believers is we are to take care of those that are serving God full time. We all are supposed to be serving God full time, mm-hmm. but some people actually are literally serving full time, yeah, living, living in the churches, Yeah, living in the church or on church property with parsonages and things like that. You need to be taking care of them because they are taking care of you spiritually. They are protecting you spiritually the yeah, least that you can do is look after them financially as well. So that's one piece of this budget conversation that has to be said is that you need to make sure you are taking care. Your pastor should at least be making the me- medium level of what the your community expects. Because you can't expect your pastor to live in a community where everybody around him makes a hundred thousand dollars more than he does and expect him to actually be able to take care of his family. Yeah. Or to stay or to stay. Now the other side of budget we get to is where we already started with the NDAs Mm -hmm. and this is where your head may start spinning and I'm going (laughs) to enjoy it. What say again, what it was when you're talking about why an NDA may be appropriate budget wise. Uh, well, the one I talked about was with missionaries or like where, where the money is going to somebody potentially overseas, uh, or just in general, like where money is being spent. Why is that something that, well, we'll start with the first part of this. Why would that be something that people want to know? With the tithes and offerings portion there, um, feels an obligation of transparency of I, if I'm a hundred percent in and you are withholding, we'll just say 10% from me, you're withholding a portion portion of this. Why can't I be a part of that too? I'm giving a hundred percent. I'm giving my time, my, my offering, whatever I'm making the sacrifices. Why can't I have full disclosure of where money is being spent? And before I, push back i want to make sure we say we are fans of transparency that is not the issue now what is the we'll go back to the christian ethics side of this what is the problem with that mindset it is very personal or i focused it's all i focused yeah it's my money i should get to decide where it's spent (laughs) all i could think of is the jg wentworth yeah (laughs) it's my money and i need it now (laughs) You know, it's my money. I want to make sure it's going where I think it should be going. If that is your statement, have you actually given up anything? Not probably not 100 percent. You haven't given up anything. You're saying that you're paying for something else at this point, expecting to see results that you want. Now, again, transparency is not the issue. Your churches, you should be able to get a copy of the budget of your church, assuming they have one, (laughs) which from a a completely different logistical part of churches, churches, you better have a budget. (laughs) You trust me, you need one. Um, But, you know, you should be able to get a copy of that. Transparency is not the issue. The issue comes when we start trying to make the demands that we know where God's money should go. One example of this is a business meeting when I was a youth pastor where I turned in my youth budget, which I only had like a $1,000 budget. And I actually spent about 4000 but we still came back with the surplus because I found donations. There you go. Because again, offerings, not just <laughs> tithes. But the big complaint from the rest of the congregation, the business meeting was that about 50% of the budget was spent on any guesses food pop. Hmm. Well, specifically it was all soda and pop depending on where you're listening from or Coke. If you're in Georgia, <laughs> although I am a Pepsi guy. So there, but there was a big problem with some within the congregation because why are, why is my money going to caffeinate these teenagers? There's a problem with that statement. 
that money was given to the church to be used for ministry. ministry. Yeah. And you're the one actually on the ground doing it. So you see. I'm the one doing the ministry. The needs. But beyond that, the focus was on where the money was spent rather than the results that came from what we were doing within the youth department. Which gets us into the next part as far as success is coming. But this is part of the issue when we start talking about some of these budgetary issues. Is that when we are talking about wanting to know every where every single dollar is going out of our tithe money. At that point, we are no longer making offerings unto the Lord. We are now investing into, insert church name here. Mm -hmm. We are wanting to be partners and investors not members of a community. Yeah. Because in a traditional business standpoint, a shareholder, whether it's 0.001% or 50% of the company has a vote or voice. You can join the call. You can hear what's happening. Uh, you might be able to send in a vote in there. And again, depending upon how much stock you have in the company depends upon the weight of your voice a little bit. So that, yeah, you're right. It does carry over to the fact that, wait, I tithe such and such amount. I should be able to have a say in this where it's percent going. of voice. And now the other part of this, before we get into where you're going with getting involved and in everything as well, is that this is just a word of caution and advice. Pastors, you do not need to know who is tithing. There are enough people within your church to be able to handle the financial side of things as far as actually counting the money and even depositing it. All you need to know as the pastor, if you are the CEO in terms of a business setting, is how much money we have to spend. That's all you need to know. You don't need to know who is tithing and who is not or who gives how much and everything else. And it's honestly better that you don't know. Because unfortunately, the human mindset is going to get into what James warns about as far as favoritism. Mm -hmm. And that is a recipe for disaster within your churches and a recipe for spiritual abuse. Which leads to NDAs. Yeah. Which we already discussed. And I and I always laugh, too, of if somebody I've had in different business settings come in and will teach about like good business practices or about leadership things. And it's not biblically based, but you can typically go back and find a scripture that supports said thing. So I always find it very humorous sometimes of like, we try to find all these books and research and do all these things, but it's like, God gave it to us. And exactly. there's so many different Proverbs. Um, like I remember, I still remember the one from college of invest in seven ventures. Yes. And eight for you do not know what destruction may come upon the land. And it was just the idea of don't put your eggs all in one basket. Say so it's literally don't put your eggs in one basket. Yeah. So there's just so many things that God gives us is that wisdom um, that we just don't search and ask for it a lot of times from a business mindset. And he gives it to us in his word. And part of the reason for that is what we're getting into with this last section here as far as what actually defines success. What is an actual, what is the idea of success from a business mindset? You are profitable on a basically on a balance sheet. So it again is all about the money, the money. Yeah. So Tradi traditionally speaking, the idea then of going back to a book that was written in the Middle East, that the first portion was written mostly by nomadic people that deals with a guy that's just telling everybody to just sell everything you have and give to the poor. Does that, is that something that is going to naturally lend itself to somebody whose only goal is profit? No, it's typically not going to be the, the main game plan that you're going to run Monday through Saturday. Exactly. Which now leads into then. So those of us that are minded of, everything that book is our game plan mm -hmm. how can we actually define success and so the first thing we we talk about this is where the fourfold rubric comes in 
Do you remember what they are, Brandon? Oh, Cause I wanted to bring it up too. And now that I was like, that's definitely what we need to, to get into for measuring success. Good. And, See, you're learning. Yay. Yeah. Uh, one more cup of coffee and it might have stayed. In so my we head. are strategic. We are, we are relevant. relevant. We are. There's another R. No, it's ah. an E. Two E's. Effective. Effective is the fourth one. Efficient. Efficient. Yes. Good job. So we are strategically relevant and efficiently effective. Strategically relevant would be this idea of this is really from a business side. Strategic. If we are strategically relevant, we are going to be receiving the ties and offerings, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, that's what a business mindset would think of. When we talk about being strategic and relevant, people are going to want to support is the idea. Mm -hmm. So that then leads us to efficiency with our money, which would be good stewards, right? Good stewards. We are being efficient. We budget well. We spend well. Transparency is a part of efficiency. That that just is a natural byproduct product. If you are being efficient then there should be some transparency there as to why you are efficient. Because if you're transparent about your efficiency, you'll get more money coming in. Mm-hmm. That that would be the business idea, right? Yeah. The more the more people know yeah, and it, see, it, a shareholder wants to see in right. a business set, setting where stuff's being spent. They're not going to typically just hand you millions of dollars. And so that leads us to effectiveness. How effective are you with that money? Now. That is all the way that typically I hear a lot of American churches talk about why they do certain things and why certain ministries get cut first and all of that. Why they budget more money for this and so this, all that. That's using the fourfold rubric, mm-hmm. but that is still stuck in a mindset of what is the ultimate Success. measure of effect? Yeah. Profit. Yeah. That is not how we measure success within ministry, how we measure, measure success. We see out of Matthew 28, Acts 1, Acts 2, and then 2 Timothy 4. So Matthew 28 is what, Brandon? Is that the making of disciples? Great commission, right? Yeah. Go out, make disciples, baptize them of all nations, teach them to obey. Success then would be making disciples. Mm -hmm. Good thing. Yeah. Acts chapter one. This is what Corey preached on for seven weeks, right? Acts one, eight. You, you, when the Holy Spirit comes on you, you will receive power. Corey's going to be very upset with you. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Jerusalem, Judea, Judea. Samaria, ends of the earth. Again. What is the measure of success? We are witnesses to the ends of the earth and we receive power and authority to do that. That is a measure of success. Acts chapter two, we talked a little bit about it with Beth Allison Barr last week with sermons. This is Pentecost. Peter delivers a sermon and what happens? 3,000 are added to their number that day. They made disciples. They saw growth. 2 Timothy 4 is a different measure of success that we're going to end on. But we want to start first with these other, these these first three chapters that we brought up here as far as what success looks like. Yeah, because I know you've brought it up in previous episodes as well, is people just get to that first initial check mark per se of, all right, their soul is one. Day's they decisions, have, have, right? Yep. They raise their hand. Yep. Check the box. They have converted and our biz, our church is successful. But then the steward, or the, the relationship side, the coming along. Well, and I'll, I'll even change. I'll, I'll challenge you there. How many churches do you see actually say we have success when one person comes to Christ? And only one. They might say that behind one-on-one but it's typically not right that's that's stated right that was one person and we had 20 people here but only one person came back that's math we're not going to give you the actual success rate 
But that unfortunately gets to be a mindset, right? Mm -hmm. That was only one person. And unfortunately, then also, again, going back to the budget, there are some people that look like, well, that one person may not be wealthy. And so we should have been doing more to get Mr. Big Bucks over here converted instead of this person. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Unfortunately, we I have heard that said in churches. Have you? Uh, no. Good. <laughs> That's good. Unfortunately, that happens most of the time behind closed doors. Yeah. You know, it, it's like it's the I don't know if they use this term anywhere else, but I'm just thinking of it from the show community of the idea of the whale. Right. Oh, yeah. We talk about whales. Right. Right. Whales. Give give us the definition of a of a whale from a business perspective. Typically, it's a large player in in your industry, whatever you're in, that has a lot of money. Of you want to work with that person or that business, that would be considered a whale. So they're making a big splash, whatever in a big financial splash. Yes, yes. yeah. That unfortunately, that conversation does happen within business meetings at times, and that conversation needs to stop because part of what the difference between a business mind of success and a ministry mind of success. And when I say ministry mind of success, business mind of success, I'm specifically talking in churches and specifically talking here, Western churches, yeah, capitalist churches, because again, cold war theology, capitalism has infiltrated the way we do church. One person coming to Christ is a success. Jesus goes after the one and leaves the 99 behind. Mm -hmm. And so what that means is that if you have to spend your whole budget to reach one person for Christ, that was a worthwhile investment. I think some people would say, was it effective? Right. And or was it, excuse me, was it efficient is right. probably the better E. Was it efficient? And so that's where we have to actually start talking about what efficiency looks like. Because there's a difference between stewardship and stinginess. And this is the parable of the talents, right? Mm -hmm. What's the parable of the talents? We'll let you go first and see if you can get it. Uh, guy gives three people three different talents. Um, different amounts different amounts was it 10 two and one something like that i think some in this is the thing that gets confusing is when you hear it people normally replace it with their own numbers so we'll go with 10 two and one that's fine perfect so the person with 10 goes and invests it um brings it back to the master that had originally given them the talents and i want to say maybe had tenfold basically had more than he than the original 10 and the master says well done. Good and faithful servant. servant yep. Um, Second guy comes back. Yep. Uh, the guy with the two talents. Uh, he invested, I think it was a little differently, but he different than the first gentleman or whoever. I shouldn't say gentleman. Anyways. First investor. Yes. First investor. And again, came back and had more than initially was given. And so it was, again, well done, my good and faithful servant. And then the one that was given just the one talent basically just put it in the ground and gave the master the same amount back that he had given him. Um, I think of lack of better terms calls him a fool. Mm -hmm. Correct. Of, <laughs> yeah. of you basically squandered it and just put it in the ground. I, I could have kept this for myself. Like why, <laughs> why did you just put it in the ground? You didn't you make use or work of it. Well, and, and he adds other pieces to it as well. So you could have at least put it in the bank so I could have received interest back. Mm -hmm. And this is where we get into the efficiency side of things. Because based off of the reaction to that last servant, if one of the initial investors had come back and said, I invested this into this thing. It went under. I've lost your money. What would the master's response have been? Probably would have been a poor decision. Poor decision, but he would not have been angry with them because they at least did something. Yeah. The guy that just puts it in his ground because he was afraid to lose it 
is the one that is called a fool because nothing came out of it. Mm -hmm. And that is the danger when we start talking about efficiency within churches. We are not profit sectors. We are profit sector sectors. <laughs> PH. That's to be your our yeah, next shirt. There we go. That should be your next shirt. Maybe. Maybe. We'll see. Maybe I can get one made today. Yeah, we'll the see. problem is it's for a profit. So uh, yeah, yeah, you know. We just lost it there. But you know, we we are not here to make profit. We are here to make disciples. Mm -hmm. And we are here to teach them what God has commanded and baptize them and see them go out and do the same thing. That is our return on investment. Yeah. And that's, as we have disciples that go out and make other disciples. And that's where I was saying, I think or sometimes the disconnect is, it's just that initial saving of the soul. And then there's no discipleship right. or bringing you shepherding spend, along. Then afterwards, it's all the initial gatekeeping. And then, all right, we got them here, but then they don't, they're still on that milk. Right. Like, if you spend a ton of money and one person comes and raises their hand and then that's it, you're done. You don't do anything with that person. Now you have wasted your investment. Yes. But if you go out and spend your money being strategically relevant, the efficiency side being you are spending that money to be strategically relevant. And you see one person raise their hand and you now dive into them and put your investment into them. You will see a return on investment. Mm -hmm. And there's one other side of this too. If you put a bunch of money into this thing and nobody raises their hand and nobody shows up Sunday morning, but you continue to do what is necessary for your community, is that efficient or not? Well, you see in the last part there of you continue to do what's necessary for your community. So I'm going to say yes. <laughs> right. It doesn't matter if anybody raises their hand. <laughs> Because if you have put the seed in their heart, that is all you need to do. Yeah. And you let God do the rest. And this comes into the whole idea of don't squander your money or, you know, the, the question I, I, I actually asked the business meeting the one day when they were complaining about not knowing where the benevolent money was going. If we go bankrupt and reach one person, was it worth it? We don't want to go bankrupt, no. but that shows us where our heart is actually at in all of this. Is one person worth all the money that we can, that we can invest and all the time that we can invest and all the other resources that we can invest is one person worth it. And if our answer is no, we need to go back and figure out why. Mm -hmm. If our answer is yes, Yes, then we need to figure out why we aren't willing to do to sacrifice then. Well, as we talked about, too, I mean, that's what God calls us to individually. Right. As Christians, too. Right. That's an individual. To that's an individual question first before it becomes a corporate one. Yeah. And we obviously see the parable of of like. I forget telling the gentleman of basically sell everything and come follow. Oh, that me. wasn't a parable. That was a straight oh, up. Yes. The rich young ruler comes up and says, How, what yeah, do I need to do ruler. to follow after you? And you says, sell, sell all everything. you have and yeah, give, it away, and give it away, yeah, give it to the, to the poor, poor and then come follow me. And the guy can't do it. Yeah, he goes away sad. And so I, I know that's a big challenge for all of us. It is for me personally to be like, what, what's that line of providing for your family or having once needs, whatever, and then and giving to And the answer to, to that is Philippians chapter four that we read a few weeks ago on peace. Because what does Paul say? And my God will meet all your needs hmm. according to his vast grace and mercy. If God is telling us to give this money, then we can be confident that God will take care of us as we do it. Mm -hmm. Which can also be, <laughs> there's always the, could also be. Of the prosperity gospel right. of, of people, their again heart posture Which, of the prosperity. If I give you said money that you need, then I expect God to give me tenfold, or I expect this. Which is about invest being an investor with a profit margin. 
Yeah, instead of an not investor being, with a prop. Not being a servant with a heart for God. Yeah. That is the difference between giving to a, a, a ministry asking for money to keep the ministry going compared to sow a seed of faith. Yeah. And where our riches are stored up and if money or as fear will go away, but obviously the kingdom of God, that that riches may pay off then. Yeah. And so it's... And we, we also, you know, when we talk effectiveness, we already said the, the way that we should define success within a church is by the disciples that we are producing. But there's one other piece to this that we already started touching on as far as the personal side of this. Because there is a personal side of being efficiently effective as well. And some of it is this heart posture stuff that we're talking about, about being able to sacrifice and be ready to do it. And about it not being about the investment I receive in return, but about the investment that I get to see happen around me within the church. Mm -hmm. But 2 Timothy 4, which we deal with a lot on here, but specifically verse 5 is what I want to look at. And this is where Paul... Paul tells Timothy to do the work of an ev- to do the work of an evangelist, endure hardship, and fulfill your ministry. That fulfillment of your ministry, that fulfillment of that being able to finally quench that holy discontent. That is what success looks like personally within these conversations. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter how much the paycheck is, even though, again, you need to be paying your pastors and your missionaries and your ministry partners. It doesn't matter how much the paycheck is. That holy discontent is being quenched. It doesn't matter how much time I'm having to spend on this with no recognition. Because that holy discontent is being quenched. Mm. That is the sign of effectiveness. And that is what leads to what the ultimate goal is of success at the end. Where we hear the master say, well well done, done, good and faithful faithful servant. servant. That is what success looks like. And that is why you don't need NDAs within your ministry. That is why the budget talks, while necessary, should not detract from the ultimate goal of the people that you are reaching rather than the amount that you have in savings for when COVID hits and suddenly your offerings drop. Mm -hmm. Because it's not about that. It's about going and making disciples. And being the witnesses in Judea and Samaria and Jerusalem and to the ends of the earth. Because that is what we are called to as believers, both personally and corporately. So hopefully this discussion was somewhat helpful, if nothing else, as far as how to have this conversation. Yeah. If you want to talk more on it, hit up the Facebook group. We'll, we'll have the discussion there. Again, we're hoping to have a second part of this dealing more with the money side of it in depth with, with Joe coming in. In the meantime, if you want to support us and the way that we were just talking about, <laughs> Patreon, go to patreon.com backslash ministry misfits. There's the four tiers there where you can select what level of partnership you would want. There's mm-hmm. some exclusive merchandise in there there's some exclusive episodes in there with joe ash thomas and christian taylor you also if you join patreon will get access to the fantasy football league through that as well you also will get uh what was the other thing there's one there's exclusive episodes yeah we said that there was something else that was in there yeah joe ash thomas christian taylor were the exclusive episodes pay attention brandon (laughs) come on anyway yeah, patreon.com. Go support us there. The The store is still up. We do have some new items in there as well because they released some new options. And so I yep. just decided to do that while Thad was asleep on me. So if you want to go check that out, you can. 
The Tikva teaser are in there as well, which the profits from that go back to yep. Tikva. Which they'll be starting again here in the next week or two, Yeah, right? next week, going yeah. back to school, uh, supporting the ministry, uh, after-school ministry here for kids. And, and there's another way you can support them as well, which is the Fantasy Football League that we mentioned at the beginning. But this year we are doing the cover charge, $10 to enter into the Fantasy Football League. But the money from that is, one, going to pay for the plaque. And then it will also, the rest of the money is all going towards Tikva. Um, and so if we are able to get the full 20 people joining the, uh, the league, then we will be able to actually give a full $200 to Tikva at the end of the season. So full disclosure there. Perfect. That's right. Transparency. <laughs> See, we like transparency. We're not just because we don't like, we say no non-disclosures does not mean we are not in of transparency. <laughs> so anyway, hopefully this was helpful. Hopefully this maybe will start some discussions and we will see you all next week. The Ministry Misfits podcast is a production of Ministry Misfit Media in association with Overwhelming Victory. Dr. Greg Linville and Andrew Fouts are our executive producers and Brandon Simmons is associate producer. The Ministry Misfits theme song is written and produced by J.D. Laird and Laird Creative Agency. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can email us at ministrymisfitmedia at gmail.com or by following at Ministry Misfit on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. You can also visit our website at www.ministrymisfits.com or through bio.link backslash Ministry Misfits. If you would like to support Ministry Misfits, you can become a patron by going to patreon.com backslash Ministry Misfits.